Dr. Cooper was the first voice I ever encountered that really spoke my language. And she basically, you know, hit the nail on the head. She's, she's like, you're, you're severely undernourished. And it really became clear that like, it wasn't so much over training. It was truly just under eating and totally wild to me to kind of have the aha moment. Like, oh, this is actually an eating disorder. Like <laughs> doing all this exercise without fuel, it sounds really trendy and cool, but man, it, it you know, you pay a really big price if you're not careful. This is Fat Science, a podcast dedicated to the science of why we get fat. No diets, no agendas, just science that makes you feel better. This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not intended to replace professional medical advice. I'm Dr. Emily Cooper. I've been treating patients with metabolic issues for over 25 years. I'm on a mission to raise awareness about metabolic dysfunction and why diets don't work. Hi, I'm Andrea Taylor. I've been fat, very fat, chubby, morbidly obese, and done almost every diet ever invented. They all worked until they didn't. I've known Dr. Cooper forever, but when I became her patient and we learned metabolism was the real problem, wow, everything changed, and I've never been healthier. And I'm Mark Wright. It's time for Fat Science. Wait, does this podcast make me look fat? Welcome to Fat Science. I'm Mark Wright, along with Andrea Taylor and Dr. Emily Cooper. Welcome. It's so great to see you both. Great to be Hi. here. On the show today, how athletes can damage their metabolism. So right off the top, we should say that even if you're not an elite athlete, this episode will have a number of key takeaways because the human metabolic system is universal. We all have a metabolism. But if you are an athlete, get ready for some inspiration because one of Dr. Cooper's patients, Russell Cunningham, is joining us to tell his story today. Russell, welcome to Fat Science. It's so great to have you here. Hey there. Thanks for having me. So, Russell, one of the reasons you wanted to come on to the show and you agreed to is that you wanted people to know that athletes are not immune from metabolic problems because they're athletes. We have this idea that athletes are somehow superhuman. To kick things off, Russell, I'd love to hear just a little bit about your history as an athlete. Yeah, sure. I think that totally kind of touches why I'm here is just because just you're active and fit and trying to be fit anyway doesn't mean you are superhuman. Yeah, my background really, as far as athletics go, it really is uh, tied in mountaineering, uh, being in the outdoors. My dad took me up about Baker when I was 12 years old and sort of kicked off a lifelong obsession with climbing and also snowboarding. And so like a lot of human powered, big mountain riding, rock climbing, all this stuff. And it's, you know, I, I've got ADHD. So I, I tend to hyper-focus on things that are, that I really enjoy. And obsession is a good way to describe it. <laughs> so Russell, talk about when your athleticism became a problem or a liability, or at least the way that you were approaching it. Because I think a lot of people think that athletes are simply immune to physiological problems because I think the common perception is that you guys are somehow genetically superior to everybody else because you can do the things that you do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it, I think that's such a good, good myth to dispel. My, my troubles really began, man, this would have been like 2003, 2004 is when it started. I was just kind of really getting into this culture of uh, light and fast alpinism, just taking a really light pack, basically no food and trying to run on mountains as fast as possible. And when you're, you know, a 22 year old male, like you can get away with a lot of bad behavior. <laughs> and um, it, it, I think for me with my, my specific, maybe like, you know, inherent neurology and the way I do get obsessive about things, I, I just took it really far. And there was this one summer in particular, I was just on a bender of climbing, climbing, climbing. And in particular, it was one trip I uh, did this single push climb up Mount Rainier. And I think it was like an 18 hour day. And I had something like five cliff bars. <laughs> and, you know, thinking back now, like we all like to say, you know, back when I was young and stupid, and <laughs> that was, <laughs> it was really silly behavior looking at it now. But I remember like, you know, the, the ascent going really well and like having good power on the way up and a lot of motivation and summiting and feeling really 
great. And then on the way down, I hit this wall. Like when you're walking down Mount Rainier, it's like 10,000 vertical feet of gain and then loss. And the punishment on your body is, it's enormous. You know, and there's these, you know, concrete paths right out of the parking lot as you get back into paradise. And I just remember hitting this wall where it was like nothing I'd ever experienced. And I remember literally thinking to myself, like, man, I don't, my heart might stop. I'm, I am so tired. Like my system is shut way down. And after that trip, you know, a couple of weeks goes by and I, it just, I wasn't recovering. I wasn't bouncing back like I had after every other trip. And that's really when this relationship with, you know, this term, the overtraining syndrome kind of came in and a uh, friend of mine threw the name Dr. Cooper my way. And I reached out to her and was able to get in. And at the time I, I had started a, uh, my undergraduate studies in exercise and sports science. And um, I was really, really tuned in and engaged with just the, the language of science and, 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 evidence and all this stuff. And Dr. Cooper was the first voice I ever encountered that really spoke my language. And she basically, you know, hit the nail on the head. She's, she's like, you're, you're severely under, undernourished. And it really became clear that like, it wasn't so much overtraining. It was truly just under eating and totally wild to me to kind of have the aha moment. Like, oh, this is actually an eating disorder. Like, <laughs> doing all this exercise without fuel, it sounds really trendy and cool, but man, it, it, you know, you can pay a really big price if you're not careful. What did you eat then? What were you eating? That's a really good question. I I mean, I think I was eating like oatmeal and I, I, I thought, I thought that I was eating balanced nutrition, but really what it was, is just like, just a severe lack of calories. I was never like a vegan or anything like that, but it was just like, that Mount Rainier climb is just one example of many where I was just fighting the, the feeling of bonking in the mountains. Like you start seeing dots in your vision, like your blood sugar is so low. And I, you know, like I said, I think about, think back to it now and it's, it just seems so silly because <laughs> I would never do that to my body now. Like for what it's worth too, it's my, my strongest performances in the mountains have come years after that where I am fueling and I am, valuing the concept of rest and balance and also being less obsessed with it. Yeah. Russell, I'm curious about the disconnect. You're studying sports physiology at the collegiate level mm. on one hand. And yet on the other hand, you're, you're doing things to your body that, that clearly scientifically <laughs> were not good decisions. Where did that disconnect come from? Because I, I don't think it's uncommon for people to have that. Oh, absolutely. And I think that that touches on a big topic that's like really near and dear to my heart. And I think there's a lot of, uh, I'll just say maybe misinformation or um, misinterpretation, maybe a better way to put it, like even within sports science and academia. Cause if you do a, you know, database search on like athlete fueling to this day, you see all these studies on like fasted training or zero carb training and it's it really is in the culture and at the time i i kind of thought that i was following the best practice of like to be the best athlete you need to be really really tuned in with your nutrition and pay to pay attention to every single thing that goes in your body and i mean that's really what the culture in the in exercise science sets and it's it's precisely i think kind of what got me into trouble to be honest yeah Dr. Cooper, I'd love you to give us kind of a scenario of when Russell first came to you. What was that? What was that like? And did it surprise you to see this guy who was doing this extreme stuff and and studying sports physiology at the same time? You know, it didn't surprise me because you would you could see that combination creating like the perfect storm in a person. And then once you start training in an underfueled state, a lot of different chemistry starts activating that can become kind of addictive. And that's the endorphins that are our opiates, something called neuropeptide Y, which kind of makes you feel 
less depressed and, and a little bit numb. And so it can become a little bit addictive to remain in that underfueled state, which is really the chemistry of eating disorders too. Um, so I was just very concerned about how to help Russell get to a much healthier place. So where do you start with somebody like Russell? Or, you know, you've worked with a number of elite athletes. Well, the hard part is trying to explain to patients in that situation that you really have to back off the exercise. You kind of can't exercise. You have to stop exercising and start fueling the body. That's the beginning to try to rebuild the nutritional state and to rebalance these hormones that are so thrown off because with it, overtraining syndrome is associated with kind of a collapse of our stress adaptation system so that when stress is applied, instead of feeling energized and mobilizing the energy to deal with it, instead we feel exhausted and just crushed under the, the pressure of the stress. And so it takes time to rebalance that whole system. And um, so that's really what you have to do. The patient needs to just you know, get away from what they have been so involved in. And that's really difficult. So when things are in the disordered side of the spectrum, it's difficult. But if they've slipped down into like a full blown, like say eating disorder picture, it's even more, much more difficult. But fortunately, Russell was able to do it. You know, <laughs> you were able to do it. You understood what was going on. It made sense to you then. You weren't so far down the spectrum, I think, just physiologically that you could still kind of pull yourself out of it without, mm -hmm. you know, huge intervention, but it was really difficult. It was really difficult. And you know what Dr. Cooper said about all the neurophysiology and the brain chemistry changes, like as my own, you know, educational process has evolved too. I've really spent years trying to understand this stuff on a, a metabolic standpoint, and, you know, creating as much academic foundation with this as I can. And she's totally right. Like the sensation of control and euphoria that people get with hypoglycemic states and like putting their body under stress, it is addicting. And it's interesting too, because like my best friend in particular, he was actually a patient of Dr. Cooper too. And he was in the exact same situation that I was. And it was really pretty ironic that like he and I spent kind of years <laughs> healing, healing each other and then getting back out in the mountains together and dabbling back into like really, really cool experiences. And, but also talking about it a ton together and, and being like, wow, you know, it's, it is important to be smart with this. Like, it's great yeah. that you two had each other as well for yeah. the support. So Russell, when your metabolism was at its most broken point, hmm. I think you and I share something in common that when I first went to Dr. Cooper, my testosterone levels were extremely mm -hmm. low to the point where I had to inject testosterone every 10 days for several years to get my body to get going to where it should be. What was that like rebuilding your metabolism? Mm -hmm. What did that feel like as, as the medical intervention started to take place? It, I mean, I think that's a really important thing to bring up. Like Dr. Cooper's got all these quotes that I love. Like one of them is we need to stop playing with our food, you know, <laughs> and it's so true. Like I, you know, maybe I'm kind of I'm far in the bell curve of behaviors or obsessive behaviors, but, but maybe not actually like, that's what I'm learning too, is it maybe isn't quite so out of the norm. Like, you know, as far as like what I can describe it to other male athletes, like when you're, when you run your system that low and your testosterone crashes out, you know, even I think I was down, I remember she said one time, she's like, you're just kind of a couple notches above like the female range in terms of my testosterone levels. And like cortisol was totally bottomed out and my zero leapt in like, and I'd like, 5% body fat or something ridiculous. And at first I just remember being kind of horrified with this news. <laughs> like really my testosterone's so bottomed out. That's not good. But you know, that was my response was like, wow, that's really not good. Like I, I, I don't know, I was smart enough at that point to realize like there's long-term health implications. And I think it's important to say too, like I was also getting a lot of positive social feedback during those years. Like 
people in school, professors, you know, coworkers, friends saying like, man, what, what you're doing is so cool. Like, I wish I was so disciplined to, to train super hard and do all this stuff. And like, well, it's not really discipline. It's just obsession, like addiction really. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's, it's not a fun experience to have your body go that low. Russell's testosterone levels were so low. His body fat levels were so low. What made all of this happen all at the same time? Well, anytime you're pushing yourself physically, that's perceived as a stressor by the body overall, a physiologic stressor. And then if you're not fueling it adequately, then the stress level then is really amplified if you're not fueling it. And that, and that causes your hypothalamus, which is a high center in the brain, to send signals to conserve energy throughout the body. And so part of that involves shutting down the testosterone. Because when your testosterone is high, it tends to make you feel like you have a lot of energy and you want to go out and spend physical energy. And so the point is to try to just help you get into a mode of where you just feel like laying on the couch and, and conserving energy to tank up your stores. Russell, I'd like to get back to the sort of cultural, social mindset aspect of this, because even the most elite athletes in the world, I remember watching a documentary about Nike bringing all the top marathoners to Oregon to try to break the, the two hour record in, in the marathon. And what they discovered when they brought some of the top physiologists to examine these guys, one of these athletes was simply not drinking enough water during a marathon. And, and he didn't even realize that. So when they fixed that, suddenly his time got way better. And it just made me realize that even in these cultures of elite athletes, there's still vulnerabilities, there's still perception problems, there's still misinformation. I'd love to know how you navigate those circles now, Russell, in terms of how you talk to other extreme athletes about all this stuff. Is it, it's, it sounds like an opportunity to, to try to help other people who maybe are going through the same thing you are. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, I think this, yeah, that was a great documentary and like the, the under hydration thing is, that's like a small example, but you know, I think there's also just like a deeper culture too. Like it's sort of trendy to do this intermittent fasting. It's trendy to, to not fuel basically, you know, in the, in the mountain athlete world, there's a, some, you know, top names that I follow and I watch their nutritional habits and, you know, it is kind of amazing to me. Like does the, you know, genetics is like a spectrum. Like some people can get away with, a lot more than what some other, not some people might be able to get away with. You know, for example, take somebody else and put them in my shoes and under fuel the exercise to the state that I did. Maybe they wouldn't necessarily crash as hard as I did, but you know, there's always still health implications. And I think for me in my own journey, like adding the language of science and, and, you know, really embracing this concept evidence-based practice, you know, that's a medical term, but applying it to exercise physiology and also just lifestyle. Like, you know, I, I, you know, Dr. Cooper's kind of used this term mechanical eating. I, I really have to utilize that basically every day. Cause to this day, like I'll start planning a, a, a mountain bike ride in the afternoon and I'll realize, man, I kind of late. I haven't really eaten lunch yet. Like day. I, okay, well, let's push that ride back two hours so that I can get that meal in. And the difference between like the fueled workout versus unfueled workout is truly profound. Like, I, you know, I don't want to, you know, I guess dive super hardcore into all the science because that's Dr. Cooper's job. But like, <laughs> you know, there's like the importance of carbohydrates. And I've had conversations with a lot of people, you know, really good friends of mine who are also like fitness influencers and social media and you know, they're promoting whatever they're doing. And I, I'm like, so I, I need to talk to you guys about anaerobic glycolysis. Like, this is why carbs are important. Like the high performance, high octane exercise is just fundamentally impossible without anaerobic glycolysis. And that requires carbohydrates. And if you let your anaerobic system get so weak because you're un under fueling your exercise, like your performance is just going to decline. It's just a fact, you know? And so I, I think back to your question of like how I navigate the culture of underfueling is it's really like, 
I just lean into, into science. Like there's, there's over a century of research on this and, you know, it's, you know, it, we all have, we all have opinions and feelings about things, but at the end of the day, like, what does the data say? What does the evidence say? And so that's, that's how I kind of try to transcend them, transcend the misinformation. Yeah. Russell, what do you see as the differences that you do daily between like when you were in your early days before pre-Dr. Cooper and post-Dr. Cooper? Like, what did you eat then? What do you eat now? How do you think about food? Like, is your whole world of food different now? Well, that's, that's, that's a really awesome question. And I'll just preface, I, um, I was in France a couple years ago and it just became clear to me the difference in attitudes towards food and nutrition over in Europe versus here. And, you know, if you're in Chamonix, for example, and you're getting ready to go up into the, into the, the hills and do some, some stuff, like they all come out of the bakery with these big baguettes and like big pile of cheese. And then like, <laughs> they'll even carry like a little bottle of wine. And it's just like a totally different relationship. And I think I've started to realize like, you know, pleasure and reward is actually very important. And feeling like emotionally good about your nutrition is so key. And as Dr. Cooper kind of brilliantly points out is like, even when you start to say like, oh man, I just weighed myself. That's a couple pounds over where I want to be. Like even just having that thought increases your ghrelin, you know? So that even just thinking about worrying about your food slows your metabolic system down and changes the fuel partitioning. So the main difference is really just try to enjoy food and then also add that mechanical element of like, all right, well, we've got this supposedly this turbocharged engine, like it only requires premium fuel. You can't not fuel it, period. You know, and that's where I, I love the term. Like if you can't fuel it, don't do it. Yeah. Right. It sounds like the deprivation systems that like regular people have with dieting and whatever, like what I grew up with, when it comes to super athlete type of stuff, it was even more magnified. Exactly. Yes. Totally. You know, we wow. were doing, we were doing it to fit into a mini skirt or into like a really nice pair of pants <laughs> and you were doing it to climb a mountain. <laughs> I love how Andrea you know what I puts mean? everything like, into perspective. Yeah. Like, uh, cause granted, I mean, honestly, I would never climb a mountain. It's not for me, but I think it would be nice. And I would helicopter up to the top to meet you at a nice restaurant, <laughs> but, <laughs> and, and look at the view and take some nice pictures. And I think it's amazing when people could do it. And for people like me, when the interesting thing I think about this whole situation is when I look at people who do what you do, I'm like, of course he's perfectly fit. Of course he's perfectly everything. Of course he or she, you know, whoever, because I see like swimmers and I see bike people and I'm like, well, their metabolism must be perfect. They must be, you know, exactly right. Their system must be amazing. They could eat anything they want. They probably are doing everything right. And then because I've worked with Dr. Cooper and I know I've met a bunch of elite athletes at her office when we're waiting for blood tests or whatever, and I hear their stories, I'm like, oh my God, really? You have problems? You have an issue? The coach told you you couldn't eat a pancake? What? It's <laughs> like, it freaks me out. It's unbelievable. And I'd like to know also, I have a question for you. Have coaches along your way, because maybe you've been on a team or something, have they like asked you to do things that your scientific background says that is really messed up information? Hmm. Like they've asked you to do things that you know is wrong just to make you a sleeker machine. I, Andrew, you just brought up so many awesome points. I've, I've kind of mostly been in the alternative sports arena, not quite so much in the organized sports like basketball, football stuff with coaches or track and field. But in the physiology world and exercise science, like absolutely, like there's so much advice on how to eat this and not eat that and cut this out. But, you know, for me, it's really important to bring up like your, your point about like the perception, like, okay, so somebody's really athletic, like 
oh, wow, they must have some perfect metabolism. Right. Um, well, I mean, just to talk about my, my own journey for a second, like I had a, a little stint with childhood obesity when I was fifth, sixth, seventh grade. I remember my parents put me on a, like a prednisone for an asthma attack one time and my weight just ballooned overnight. And I wasn't like morbidly obese or anything, but it was like all of a sudden I was went from this normal weight kid to this kid with like really kind of severely elevated weight. And it took five years until I hit puberty for my weight to kind of normalize again. And I think for me now, looking back, it's like, oh, so the, the genetic vulnerability was there. And my exercise-induced disordered eating behaviors just really kind of triggered that. But I also, you know, I look around like how many professional sports athletes, and I think about like Tour de France people, or for example, like once they're done with their careers, a lot of them end up with like really severe obesity issues like at a kind of a really high clip, like a substantial percentage of them do. And, you know, it's like we can talk about exercise science and it is movement is so important to health, like your cardiovascular system. And it is important for your metabolic system to move your body. But if you are one of these people with a genetic vulnerability and you push it hard or you don't fuel or, or maybe just some environmental toxin, you never know. Like we all have our vulnerabilities. And I think if we're all human, that's, that's the take home message, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, so wrap things up. I'd love to hit two points before we do. And this has been so great, Russell, mm -hmm. but Dr. Cooper, I'd love it. If you would address, I feel like there's still a culture among coaches at every level that under fueling is not necessarily a bad thing because like Andrea said, they think fewer calories will just make you leaner faster. and stronger and, and faster. Can you address that Dr. Cooper? Yeah, unfortunately, it's pretty widespread and it's really incorrect information. So we, we should be really thinking about our fuel as part of our training, you know, for athletes. The fueling is part of your, your training and your performance, and it's a really important part. It's the foundation that you're made of, you know, for your muscle, tendon, ligament repair, and the energy supplies that are stored in the muscle to make you go faster, have more power. So it's really a mistake to leave that out. And it, it leaves just a lot on the table for athletes just in terms of performance, but again, sets them up for problems with overtraining syndrome, recurrent injuries, and, you know, unfortunately, probably disordered eating and eating disorders, bone density issues goes on and on. <laughs> but I always think we should be thinking of fuel first. So instead of thinking, oh, I'm doing all this training, and it's just so hard to eat enough to support that. I hear that from patients, even, even some of my patients I've had for a while say that. And I'm thinking, haven't you learned anything? You know, what you should really be doing is thinking, well, how much can I eat? And then that will determine how much you can exercise. It, so it, we have it flipped around. It should really be, how much can I responsibly fuel? And then that can tell you what, you know, what you're allowed to be able, able to do exercise wise, because you've, you've properly fueled the body. You're not putting it into that under fueled stress mode. If you think that through, and it does take planning, you have to plan ahead for your food. As Russell said, think about what you're going to do when you're going to do it, because as you're exercising at the levels that, that Russell tends to do, <laughs> there's no way you can fuel during the exercise to compensate for all of the calories and carbs and things that you're burning. So you have to put some of that fuel in before the exercise to buffer it with more nutrition during and after. And you just have to make sure that you do compensate for that expenditure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Russell, I'd love you to speak directly to that extreme athlete or even just that athlete out there and address that person in a way that may have resonated with you when you were going through this as a younger man. The more you really try to obsess with your exercise and your food, the more, in my experience, your performance is going to suffer. In fact, like the more I've been able to take a step back and like kind of quote unquote care less about it. I've felt 
orders of magnitude more physically powerful in that way. And but I also I I really do think that human beings we have this huge brain and we're really smart, right? And I that's why I love the language of science and like a lot of the people I end up interacting with are in the exercise physiology world. And I would like to point out things like, okay, so let's say XYZ research study says, you know, low carb training can do this and this. Well, that, you know, there's so many limitations to these research studies and they're not long-term. And also none of them are measuring metabolic hormones. So like, for example, when the brain perceives severe starvation, it basically triggers insulin resistance. So people are doing this stuff like low carb exercise to quote unquote, increase their insulin sensitivity. When really it's like multiply this out by some, some time duration, we well, are actually going to trigger insulin resistance <laughs> because you're under fueling because your brain is like, I need stop giving the muscle cells that glucose. I need that glucose. And also I think there's a lot of, uh, like, as you said before, misinterpretation because those studies with under fueled exercise or low carb exercise, people kind of glommed on to the fact that it showed that people were burning more fat when they exercise, but the fat they're burning is intramuscular triglycerides, not adipose tissue. And so, and the reason they were burning a higher percentage of these triglycerides, you know, fat stores in the muscle for energy. The reason they're doing that is because they were depleted of the carbohydrate stores. <laughs> so they had no choice. Their body had no choice, but to tap into those alternative fuel, but the alternative fuel doesn't enable you, as you said earlier, to get into that anaerobic power zone where you're going to go faster and perform better. Uh, in fact, all of the studies show you know, a reduction in performance on these low carb diets. So people, again, I think because our culture is kind of fat focused, they glommed on to the, <laughs> to the sentence that said that it was burning more fat. And I think that's really what popularized it, unfortunately, without looking deeper at what did the science actually say? The science said you burned more intramuscular triglycerides, which are a fat store, you know, source of energy in your muscles, but you also went slower and you didn't have as good performance on repeated efforts. So that's a bit frustrating how that, that kind of <laughs> the science, you know, people that quote the science, but they're, they've misinterpreted it. So that's unfortunate. Andrea, any final thoughts as we wrap it up? Well, I guess it just means that all those beautiful athletes are not as healthy as we think they are. <laughs> they just, they look good, but inside, not so good. <laughs> not all of them. That's a that's, good lesson. I mean, that's a good you know, point. It's, this, it's yeah. the thing. It's like what Dr. Cooper has said before. Just because somebody looks good on the outside, it doesn't mean they're healthy on the inside or because they don't look as good on the outside. They might be healthy on the inside too. You it's know, true. I mean, mm -hmm. that it, you cannot, as they say in the olden times, you cannot judge a book by its cover. <laughs> totally. No. And even doctors are kind of guilty of that. They well, are very major. quick to, to size up somebody right. based on what their lifestyle's like or their body right. habitus. And they can, you know, unfortunately, a lot of athletes are underdiagnosed with various conditions right. because because mm -hmm. they would think that you're so, you know, like somebody like you, Russell, they would think that you're totally healthy. You don't need any tests. You don't need to go through anything. There's just like some kind of little glitch that happened and let's just blow it over. And the body image side is such a huge deal too. Like some of the hands down best athletes I personally know, they don't fit the, you know, quote unquote, perfect body image. And like, just the idea that like, you know, your, your health, your fitness, your body weight, these factors are not actually, you know, they're, they're not totally intertwined in the way that we all think they are. Like right. you can totally be on the high end of the BMI scale and totally healthy and an amazing athlete. Totally. Right. Thank you, Russell. Russell, this has been such a, a great uh, time with you because I just think your personal story has so many amazing takeaways as you were discovering the journey of how to use your metabolism, how to respect your metabolism, and also navigate this world of extreme sports. I think it's going to resonate with a ton of people. And also, 
a lot of stuff you said went over my head, but I know it didn't go over Dr. Cooper's head because <laughs> your knowledge of this from a scientific level is really admirable. And the fact that you're able to discuss it uh, at that level, I think, is a, a credit to who you are and what you're trying to do in the world. So, man, keep up the great work and super grateful that you wanted to share your story with us. Thanks so much for having me. It's, it's a real pleasure, seriously. Yeah. So, Russell Cunningham, Dr. Emily Cooper, Andrea Taylor, Thanks so much for a great episode. This has been another edition of Fat Science. No diets, no agendas, just science that makes you feel better. I'm Mark Wright. Thanks for listening to Fat Science with Dr. Emily Cooper, a Work P2P production. New episodes drop every Monday. If you've enjoyed the conversation, subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. This production is for informational purposes only and is not intended to replace professional medical advice. Join us next week for another episode dedicated to the science of why we get fat. No diets, no agendas, just science that makes you feel better. <laughs>